Good evening and welcome to tonight's event by Staffordshire University. My name is Janelle Aldred. 28 years ago, Stephen Lawrence was murdered in a racially motivated attack on the 22nd of April, 1993. It took 18 years for two of his year killers to be convicted. But because of Stephen, institutional racism within the police was brought into the spotlight sparking one of the most important moments in British criminal justice. The impact Stephen's story has had on policing so far and the media portrayal of his story and the protests against police brutality and also racially motivated violence against black people over the decades. And all of this is coming today against the current backdrop of the conviction of a police officer who murdered George Floyd last year. So before before we hear from our first speaker, I'd like us just to have a moment's silence just to remember Stephen and to reflect also on what a more just world could look like. Thank you for that moment of honouring his memory. I'd now like to introduce Andrew Proctor. He's Staffordshire University's Pro Vice Chancellor, and he's going to be giving us a welcome. But following on straight after him will be Dr. Derek Campbell with our first keynote. Now, Derek is a consultant who has worked in the community for over 30 years. He has worked with young people to move them from crime to education. He also works with organisations to improve their culture, environment and effectiveness. And he has worked both nationally and internationally and, into, and influenced change in national policy and youth affairs. But first, we will go to Andrew. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to our event to mark the third annual Stephen Lawrence Day. Stephen's story remains as devastating and powerful now as it was then. While Stephen's tragic death forced change in British law, there is still much more we must do to combat racism. We owe it to Stephen and his family to strive for equality and inclusion in everything we do. Here at Staffordshire University, we are passionate about transforming the lives and prospects of people from all parts of our communities. And we have a responsibility to provide a safe space for difficult discussions that shine a spotlight on the issues that matter most, to challenge ourselves, to listen to and empathise with the lived experiences of others, so that we may develop our understanding and ultimately become a better, fairer, more equitable society. I firmly believe that whereas talent is distributed equally across this country, opportunity sadly is not. The society we currently live in is not equitable. And therefore, a huge test for UK policing is its ability to fairly police a society that itself lacks equity. I'm personally delighted we are joined today by Sir Dave Thompson, QPM, Chief Constable of West Midlands Police. Knighted in the Queen's New Year's Honours for his service to policing, and made Deputy Lieutenant for his work in the community. As Vice Chair for the National Police Chiefs Council, Sir Dave is leading the National Plan of Action for Race and Inclusion, focusing on internal culture and inclusivity, the use of police powers and community engagement. I was fortunate to work for a number of years under his leadership at West Midlands Police, and to this day, I still remember him outlining to me how the importance of diversity and inclusion is reflected in the Pelian principles which have underpinned policing since 1829. The police are the public and the public are the police, essentially citizens in uniform. If the police service does not accurately reflect the diversity of the citizens it serves, 
how can it be considered truly legitimate? And that very much resonates with something historian David Elusuga, OBE, spoke to us about and challenged us with in his keynote at our recently held race inclusion conference. He told us, while you walk through the communities of your local area and region, you can see and celebrate diversity all around you. If this diversity disappears, the minute you walk into your workplace, something is wrong and something needs to change. Three years ago, we partnered with our four regional police forces, Staffordshire, Warwickshire, West Mercia and West Midlands Police. Each of us share a commitment to eradicate racism in all its forms and develop diverse student officers from all backgrounds with a career they can thrive in and be proud of. Working together, we can ensure that opportunity for public service is provided much more fairly and inclusively. A big thank you from me to Dr. Derek Campbell, who joins us from the Independent Office for Police Conduct to deliver our first keynote. Also our panelists, Paul Giannassi, OBE, Hate Crime Advisor to the National Police Chiefs Council, Dion Johnson, Vice President of the National Black Police Association, and Staffordshire Police's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Officer, and our very own Jane Sawyers, QPM, Deputy Lieutenant and Associate Professor of Policing Practice, who previously led Staffordshire Police as Chief Constable until 2017. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our wonderful presenter, Janelle Aldred, who, since graduating from Staffordshire with a master's degree in broadcast journalism, has worked as a newsreader and journalist for the BBC, ITN and ITV. Welcome back, Janelle. And finally, thank you, our audience, for joining us today to take part in this important occasion and helping us to ensure that stories like Stephen's will never be forgotten and will continue to drive us towards making positive change across society. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Derek Campbell. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Andrew, and to my fellow panelists and to the guests who are joining us today. I thank all of you and hope that today's or this evening's event will be one that will be hopefully remembered um, as we go forward. I was asked to do a short talk really about my own personal journey as a black man growing up in uh, Britain um, from when I was born in the in the early 60s um, until how did I end up being the police watchdog overseeing the activities of the police and holding them accountable. So that's the sort of context in which I'll be delivering my speech and I will then dovetail that into the impact Stephen Lawrence has had on all our lives and the way it has shaped a society uh, in Britain going forward. Go back to your own country. Go back to your own country, you black bee. You black wog. You black sambo. You N. These statements with the daily staple for me and my family as we grew up in, on a council estate in the Midlands during the late 60s, through the 70s, into the 80s. No blacks, no dogs, no Irish was a common notice on many properties. On others, the notice simply said, rooms to let. But when the landlady opened the door and saw the colour of your skin, the rooms were, were miraculously no longer available. Hearing my mother tell me about the times that she stood at the bus stop waiting to go to work, white people would come up to her and lift up her coat and her skirt and ask her, where is your tail? Others would approach her and touch her face and ask if she was that colour all over. Also hearing my dad recount his numerous experiences as a bus driver and tell me how white teddy boys would spit in his face as they came onto the bus and then chase him and stab him. You effing N was a constant refrain. 
whilst watching television, we would see images of black people being derided and ridiculed in shows like the black and white minstrels, hearing us being insulted and in programs called, uh, such as Till Death Do Us Part and Love Thy Neighbour. Whilst at school being streamed into the lower level sets and only the white kids being streamed into the higher level sets, we were told that only white kids could succeed academically because you blacks and you brown kids were only good enough to do sports and run around the field and kick a football because of your physical prowess. Our education system consisted of institutional racist stereotypes. While at school, I used to read books that when I look back at them now, they were morally bereft. Books like Little Black Sambo, and I remember talking to friends of mine and telling them of my experience. And they would say, no, you're making it up, Campbell. There's no way they would ever read books like that at school. I was desperate to prove them wrong until one day I stumbled across the book I read at school called Little Black Sambo. When I showed my friends, they thought I was making it up. But actually, I bought it from Waterstones only a few years ago. The so-called careers officer sitting with you and asking you what you wanted to be when you left school and me eagerly saying, I want to be a doctor. I wanted to see him smirk and laugh and tell me I would be better to be a dustman. Or even better, you'd get a job in a factory. To thousands of young black and mixed race Britons who thankfully cannot remember those decades, the racism of the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, the fear and insecurities it bred in our minds as black people are different, are difficult to imagine or relate to today. But they're powerful memories for me and my generation. I was 14 years old when the BBC finally canceled the black and white minstrel show in 1978. I have memories of my mother telling us, it's just a show as she rushed to the TV to change the channel to save us from its exposure of the gratuitous caricatures of black on prime, of blacks on bright primetime TV. When outside playing with my friends, the police would turn up in their black mariahs and set the dogs on us as we ran for cover. Then some of us would be taken down to the local station to be beaten up in the cells. One of the tricks was to hit us on the back bottom of our feet so it wouldn't bruise or the bruises wouldn't show with towels. Seeing the police harassing black youths with the dreaded sus laws, which was a tool simply to racially abuse us, depriving us of our liberty and freedoms to move around because they said we looked suspicious. These experiences informed my personal childhood and my view of the 1970s and the 1980s growing up in Britain. During the 1970s, the police oppression and brutality caused anger and resentment in me and my generation. The police policed with impunity as blacks were seen as parasites and valueless. My mother, in an attempt to protect her children, drilled into us. Don't look into the face of white people when they talk to you. It's disrespectful. Don't talk or answer back to white people. But this is not our country. They don't want us here. Our parents taught us to fear the white man. We internalize these teachings and these teachings caused us to resent and mistrust white people. I became an activist and a campaigner, fighting for justice and racial equality, marching in the uprisings of the 80s against police brutality, seeing the aggression of the police perpetrated against blacks brought deep resentment and distrust and ushered in the rise of the Nati Bongos. The Nati Bongos appeared in the early 70s. They were a hybrid of the Jamaican Rastafarian and the British youth angered by police brutality. The police would often refer to them as the dreads community. 
Their agenda was to bring down Babylon, Britain and its agents, the police. Hence, they coined the phrase of the police that they are Babylon, the wicked ones. But what now? Having shared that, what now? As I grew up, it was hard to unlearn what my life so far had taught me. My life experiences had etched indelibly in me. Disadvantage, discrimination and hatred. It was hard to trust the police and see them as agents for good instead of agents for bad. But I was determined as I continued to grow up and to strive to make a difference, working in the community with the state agents, such as the Home Office, ACPO as was, now called the National Police Chief Council, working with the Secret Services, my understanding of the role and importance of having law and order was impressed upon me. And I started to realize we needed an effective police service. I was sent to different countries on behalf of the government, being the national leader and advisor to two prime ministers, six home secretaries and the secret service. The first black man to ever hold a seat on the control group working out of Scotland Yard. I was able to go to different countries to inform other police services of how to police their communities fairly. It was this process that helped me see that although the British police are not perfect, they are by far in comparison better than many other police services in other countries. Stephen Lawrence, his death was a watershed moment of shame for the British police service in particular the Metropolitan Police, as it highlighted the blatant disregard and low value the police placed on the life of black people in this country. And that black people are not judged for who they are, but simply because of the colour of their skin. Some will still wonder if the police service is working to change its attitude towards racism because they recognise that they should some cynically say they are simply trying to change as they have been shamed into doing so by the public outcry and because we now have mobile phones. Today I work within the system because as a former activist I felt it better to be sitting around the table on the inside trying to make a difference and improve policing in this country. It is better to be on the inside making a difference and on the outside simply throwing stones and shouting. I'm optimistic and remain so, as I've seen huge progress within the way our society is now policed. The police have done a good job so far in attempting to make a change. And I believe that cooperation, understanding and determination will get us to that place where not only do black lives matter, but black lives matter the same as white lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. That was extremely powerful and so interesting to hear not only your story, but your journey through those different phases from the 70s to now. And I would like to remind everyone we do have a Q&A later. So if that has sparked some questions, then please do um, put those questions in the chat box and we are going to aim to get through as many questions as we can in the Q&A later. But thank you so much, Derek, for sharing so powerfully. And now uh, I'm my pleasure to introduce Sir David Thompson to give his keynote speech. And again, if you hear things that spark interest, do put your questions in the chat box. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I did slightly dread following Derek because I, I knew actually the, the passion that he would bring to the conversation today. I, you may find me a little bit more cold, perhaps, and logical, but I, but I hope interesting. Um, 
It's great pleasure to join you here today. As, as, as Andy said right at the start, we, we have a, a great collaboration with Staffordshire University that plays a part in training our officers. And particularly on a day like uh, today, on Stephen's Day, we, we reflect, I think, on uh, that talent that was lost and the need to bring us together to make a better society that flourishes. And so, uh, as you said in the introduction to me earlier today, uh, I am proud, hugely proud to be the Chief Constable of West Midlands Police. Um, we police one the youngest population of any police force in the country and the second most diverse. And issues of race and inclusion and diversity are a day-to-day -day part of my role and actually my national role now as the police service responds to what were, I think, seismic events that took place last summer with George Floyd's death. Um, I, I set the context for the debate we're having on race because actually it's a very different discussion and context than we had at the time Stephen died, a very early in my career. It's a time where my truth and my lived experience might rival your facts. The emotional narrative of how we feel may actually be more powerful sometimes than the facts. And indeed, I think this is some of the tension the recent CRED reports face. It's, it's a time where issues that create out, outrage could be seen by millions in a second, but the factual response to what happened may take years to assess. And the offence is, is, is then long gone, but remembered, but the outcome of, uh, uh, and the truth may follow Public views shaped by global, not just local events. Oh, an era where we want soundbite news consumption because we don't read the newspapers in the depth. And that means sometimes complex societal issues are seen as needing very quick and simple solutions. It's a tricky time for police because there is a growth of laws and policing to regulate disapproved behaviour. We've spent the last year enforcing public health regulations. And for those of you interested in this, I, I draw your attention to Lord Sumpton's Reith Lectures in 2019, where he talks about this growth of the use of law to regulate social norms. That's tough for policing. It's also an era where, you know, the social media echo chamber reinforces views and discourse, and the interaction between opposing views is now an ill-tempered shouting match. And social media has created a tremendous level of, of accessibility for policing, and a time also for a service that tries to be impartial, where young people actually expect institutions to adopt strong positions on societal issues, which creates a challenge for a service that also wants to be neutral. And I set that context because context is everything as to how we move forward upon this debate. The police have always been, quite rightly, at the, the centre of the issues around race and equality, the sharp pointy end. Sir Robert Mark, who was the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, used a phrase that still remains suitable today, that the police are the anvil on which society beats out problems of abrasion, social inequity, racial prejudice, weak and ineffective legislation. And while many of Mark's views have aged, those of us in policing still feel that policing is always at the front end of this debate. And that's inevitable. We are a part of the state that exercises coercive powers. But actually, we all welcome the work of the Race Disparity Unit in government that started to say issues of racial discrimination are much wider than the police. And indeed, police are charged with policing in an inequitable society. It's inevitable that those issues emerge. But nonetheless, we shouldn't slacken our challenge off on race and policing. Indeed, one of the things that I think was powerful about this summer was actually a mature and cathartic discussion in policing about where we were on these issues. And I have to say that happened in West Midlands Police. We, we recently published a summer of conversations that we had where the shocking reality is still that we are a, society, a police force that's no longer, it's still not free of bias, discrimination and on occasion racism is still present. And actually, while I think policing has moved tremendously and I am hugely proud West Midlands Police is the second most inclusive employer in the country, we should be known under illusions that this is still a live issue and a live issue because the expectations of more of society are that we are better on this. So many of the demonstrations we saw this summer were not of black people alone. They were joined by people across the country in towns and villages of different generations of white and black. And so it's right, policing has to lift our game. So, so where are we now? Well, as was said right at the start, <coughs> Peel's principles always signaled the police should be an impartial body, a body that polices regardless of social standing and race. And that sits strongly in Peel's sixth principle. I apologise last year for our history because it is clear, as Derek set out, there is a history of discrimination and racism. We're not free of discrimination, bias or racism. 
And whatever the issues and the debate that's going on currently around the CRUD report, we need to be very clear as policing, there remains, <coughs> excuse me, a legitimacy gap with black communities. And it takes place also at a time following COVID, where in Birmingham, for example, in the West Midlands, five of the top 10 wards with the highest levels of unemployment in the country are now in the city. And we know nationally a third of young black people are out of work. These are tough and challenging times for policing and race. So in describing where we are, are we broken on race? I, I'm pleased Eric recognises, I, I think in the 31 years I've been in the police, huge progress has been made and I'm very proud of the progress we've made, but still some of those issues have only really changed relatively lately. Last year I appointed the first time we'd had a black assistant chief constable reach the highest levels of West Midlands Police. And indeed in our history, there are only two black officers that have made their way above the rank of chief superintendent from constable within the force. We've had many other black and ethnic minority officers who've transferred in, but so few people have climbed the position where Matt Ward has done to the very top levels of the service. And that shows how far policing still has to go. I'm also conscious policing is often pushed about whether we're institutionally racist. I, I've always found today that term a zero sum game. Refuse to accept it and you're in denial. Accept it and the whole system's broken and there's a victory for those who are critical of policing. So there are some huge contradictions in this space where, uh, in terms of how we address the issues. I, I perhaps would turn to the language of race to describe where we are because while the recent race disparity report by the CRED uh, 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 report that was produced, there are many issues in that report that many will disagree with. It'll be a fertile area of conversation. It is a clash between lived experience and an interpretation of facts. And indeed, I would say some of the chapters around policing are not challenging. But actually, one of the areas I do think in the report is interesting is trying to redefine the language of race. The CRUD report talks about explained racial disparities where we know why there may be differences in how different ethnic communities are treated. Uh, unexplained racial disparities. Too often, something doesn't look right and we can't explain it. Institutional racism, where an institution has racist or discriminatory processes, attitudes or behaviours in line with McPherson. Systematic racism between connected organisations or wider society. And then finally, structural racism to describe a legacy of historic racist or discriminatory processes. If there's one strong thing that emerges from that report, is trying to actually use that structure as a means of beginning a conversation that actually begins to help diagnose the problem at a time where we manage the imbalance and the emotion between facts and feeling. At times, all five of those factors may apply or touch into policing. Sometimes we can explain why there are racial disparities. We police an unequal society. Too often, I find today, we confront issues where we can't quite explain why there's a disparity, but we need to answer that question. And of course, as we constantly examine and challenge the work we do, we have issues where there are aspects of policy and practice that discriminate that we must eliminate. And it'd be interesting as we discuss that as we go forward. But a recent stop search report by Her Majesty Inspector of Constabulary, Wendy Williams, identified this challenge and asked the question that while we could demonstrate that stop search is happening in high crime areas, we couldn't explain why it was largely around drugs and we couldn't explain sufficiently well why there was disproportionality. And her challenge to the service was, if you intend to use this power, you have to be capable of explaining why that is the case. And so that is quite a lot of the work, both in West Midlands Police and the work we're doing nationally to try and address this. But it's not easy, let's be clear. I went to the States some time ago to look at racial profiling, particularly around stops of vehicles, a huge concern for many young black men. And yet actually, how do you identify in a balanced way to assess whether there is discrimination when vehicles are stopped? Connecticut ran trials for a year, different times of day, different times of night, to create models and ways of assessing whether or not those issues are present. So this is not easy or simple. So uh, uh, in setting the context, in talking about the language, I just probably want to now just talk on the final areas where I think policing will need to concentrate and work over the coming years to try and improve and build that legitimacy gap. So the first is we need to move policing from being seen by many black communities as over policing and under protecting. Too many people fear the police's intervention don't feel protected, particularly amongst young people. And there's a real challenge in this. 
So when we look at crime and particularly crimes like homicide, we know in the West Midlands, young black men are three, three and a half times more likely to be a victim and 6.2 times more likely to be the offender in knife and violence than actually a white offender. That creates a challenge for policing because we wish to stop that level of victimization. Our challenge then is we will use policing activity and tools that can engender a lack of trust, stopping, searching, intervention. They are the tools the police bring to these issues, and yet they themselves drive a level of race disparity. We search um, black men, particularly, but black people four and a half times more then we search white people and we use force three and a half times more than we on black people than we use on white in the West Midlands. That's a huge challenge for us back into my criteria to ensure we can understand why that's the case. And in some areas on search, we are approaching that point. The closer we look at particular areas and locations, we begin to understand that our searches do reflect communities that are there. However, worryingly, they remain too highly focused on drugs and not weapons. But on use of force, this issue is one area that we are just not simply clear why that disparity exists. So we need to strike that balance between making sure we're preventing that crime, but at the same time, where we're using our powers, they're used and demonstrably used more fairly. To do that, we need to understand the stats back to these unexplained racial disparities. We can't explain use of force well, and we're doing a huge piece of work in the force to understand what is driving that. We can put in place fair oversight and processes in the community and actually West Midlands Police is cited by the HMIC and also by the CRED report for having done that. We need to make sure we don't cause collateral victimisation. Searching for weapons can build community support, but if that criminalises lots of young black men for possessing small amounts of cannabis, that can't be right. And again, in the CRED report, the work Thames Valley Police and West Midlands Police do to try and ensure that the collateral impact of drugs possession while dealing with violence is dealt with. And of course, the work Derek does, making sure police conduct is scrutinised robustly, both at a community level and when things aren't right by the IOPC. But more than that, it's about ensuring that the police's tactics to deal with violence are improved. So the violence reduction programmes will show that actually the police are less likely as an agency to be effective at reducing violence than many other than interventions. And so those interventions are the heart of what we do because actually violence is better prevented, not by some robust policing. In terms of the third area is who's the police. We talked about the representation. It's really important that we are seen as a career of choice. There's more work to do on uplift and attraction. But that also comes with creating an inclusive culture, which is why the particular work we've done to make West Midlands Police more inclusive for all communities, for, uh, for, for women, for people with disability, because an inclusive environment works for everybody and is critical to ensure colleagues feel welcome. But policing is more than the police. And so the growth of a thousand members of the public who patrol with the police through street watch in West Midlands is important. Many of those are in inner city communities. Many of them involve black members of the community and ethnic minorities. Many involve women from those communities taking an active part in helping us police. And of course, um, our cadet programme is particularly targeted on inner city young people. The West Midlands Police cadets are the most diverse part of the force, almost 70% from black and ethnic minority communities. That work also helps us socialise more with black communities when we're not on the job. Because one of the things we've learned through our work is so many officers have no lived experience of black communities except through their policing. And the final two areas quickly are ensuring that actually what issues we concentrate on are properly focused. A lot of work now on use of big data, we must make sure that police services don't build bias into their data. And we're robust on this. We recently did some work around violence prevention and we used a predictive model. We eliminated the work on that model with our ethics committee because we could not eliminate bias within it. We've also got to make sure in those work we do that we concentrate on satisfaction of service. That's why crimes like hate crime are very important and British policing leads the world on that work, but making sure the public we serve are satisfied. And then finally, how we police. The growth of procedural justice, making sure that actually we use good communication involvement, effective skills to ensure we build legitimacy in the way we act. And of course, making sure our processes are aligned to every community, and particularly David Lamy's work about the criminal justice system poses challenges to ensure we work most effectively. I guess finally, 
the context for policing again. Actually, jobs, economic growth and opportunity are vital in this area. The disparities young people suffer continue to reinforce an environment where actually those issues of deprivation and challenge bring them often into the conflicts of the police. So I'll end there just in terms of, of the input today. I, I hope uh, I've set our context. I hope I've focused on some of the language and I hope I focus on some of the areas that policing wants to make a difference. Thank you so much, Sir David. That was um, great to hear about your thought leadership and how leadership feels about policing. And hopefully as we go into this Q&A session, um, we will flesh out also what the panel thinks of both those keynotes they've heard as well as your questions. So as we step into the Q&A, I would first like to ask Dion Johnson to introduce herself. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dion Johnson, I am Vice President of the National Black Police Association um, and I'm also Staffordshire Police's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Officer in Lead. So I'm a staff, um, not a police officer. Thank you, Dion. And now if Jane Sawyers could introduce herself, please. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Jane Sawyers, you heard Andrew say I had a 33 year career in policing in Staffordshire and I'm now um, a lecturer, I'm an associate professor in policing practice at the university and lecture students on two undergraduate degrees. Uh, and if, if I have a third hat here tonight, uh, in 1983 when Stephen was murdered, um, I was married, my husband's black. By the time the uh, Stephen Lawrence inquiry report came out, I had two children and soon after that a third. Um, so while I would never claim to have the lived experience of some of the panel members, I have suffered racism uh, as a result of having a mixed race family. Thank you so much, Jane. And uh, last but definitely not least, Paul Gianna Giannassi. Sorry, um, if you'd okay. like to introduce yourself, hopefully I got that right. <laughs> it's it it probably closer than I get. So um, I'm Paul Giannassi, I'm, I'm a former police officer. Most of my career was in policing um, in Staffordshire in 2007. I was seconded to run the Government Hate Crime Programme, which led from the Race for Justice judge-led review uh, that looked at the way the state had responded to the Stephen Lawrence inquiry and the recommendations, and it felt there needed to be a more cohesive policy that crossed all elements of government, uh, all elements of the state, including the criminal justice system, obviously. Uh, and I was seconded in to run that in 2007 for a year on secondment and never came back. So I, I do the role um, for, for about 12 years, in, including on the foreign policy side, and then I now advise the MPCC as the uh, hate crime officer. Thank you so much. So we are going to go to our first question. I know people are putting questions up on YouTube. I can't see them currently, but they are going to be sent to me, so I will ask them, but we have some others. And the first question that we have is from West Mercia Police's superintendent, and I really want to pose that to um, Dion. Um, it says, we increasingly see international events affecting local sentiment and the opposite with local events escalating to the national and international scale. Um, how do we ensure community engagement and conversations across all levels to ensure that the implications of events are appropriately managed in partnership with communities? That's a very long question, but hopefully you caught that and I will put it in the chat just in case. Thank you. Uh, and I think I think I got um, uh, the majority of that. Uh, I think it's really important that our officers and staff do build uh, the relationship with the communities that they are serving. Um, I think that it's really important that there's that regular, it's not, it's not tokenistic um, uh, communications with, with their communities. Um, it's, it's an actual real um, relationship that they're building with, with, the, with their community. So it would then make things so much more, so much less complex when we are dealing with um, anything from funerals all the way to protests it's really i just think it's really important that we have that regular contact um with the with our communities and and so often a lot of forces say that yes they have that that neighborhood um feel those neighborhood officers but when you when you really scratch the surface of it um, these officers aren't communicating with with the majority of their community that sometimes the police officers are too busy 
even down to the local police community support officers are also too busy. But I think it's integral to part of neighbourhood policing that that time is made to build those bridges and those relationships between the police and their communities. Thank you so much, Dion. And um, the next question is for Derek. And there is one question from the audience, something that I'm just going to kind of um, riff off the back of your keynote speech. So in your keynote speech, you spoke really powerfully about the very physical and visceral racism that you experienced as a youth. Looking at the way that racism takes shape and form now, it's slightly different. It, it tends to not often be so visceral. So what do you think that how that impacts the future generations that disconnect from the way things were to the way things are and also when Stephen Lawrence was killed did that initially feel like a step back in racial unity because that kind of came at the halfway point from when things were very physical and visceral to how they are now so would love to hear about your context for that so so the first part of that um my my view is very very clear because Racism is still alive and kicking and is probably more insidious today than it was before. Years ago, you would see the skinheads, you would see the racist, and you'd know, you'd know exactly where they were. Now racism has a new suit, has a new dress, and has a new hairstyle. And, you know, it's now parading itself out there as sort of something that's no longer um, as, as potent as it was. But because it's much more difficult to, to identify, many people find it difficult to really get to grips with it. Laws and policies can restrict how I behave publicly, but it has very little in changing my heart and mind. And I think the challenge for, for, for people of today's generation is that, A, we've got to help people understand what racism is and how it manifests itself in people's be, uh, behavior. Uh, and, and B, we've got to work with them to help them try and change that behaviour. Just being aggressive, just throwing your hands up and saying everything is racism will have very little. Black Lives Matter were great at marching in the streets. My criticism of Black Lives Matter matters is after the shout, what? And that's the challenge. It's the what that we've got to get to grips with. And the best way to do that is that we've got to work with the police, we've got to work with the government, we've got to be part of the process and being part of the process is the best way of trying to shape and encourage and help us move to forward together, black and white. In regard to the Stephen Lawrence issue, it wasn't a step backwards, it was just business as usual. Stephen was not the only one that was murdered in the streets and his death was just disregarded by the police at the time. We saw many, many people equally who were just gone down, who were just killed in police custody and lost their lives and justice was never brought to the bear, uh, to, brought, 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 people were not brought to justice. And I think when, when, he, when it happened, it, it made, it, it, was the, it was the determination of his mother, the dogged determination when everybody disregarded her and she was not prepared to let her son die in vain. It was that that really inspired me, the determination of someone to stand up and say, no, this is not acceptable. It took years seven years for McPherson to eventually come to a conclusion that the police should have done better. So for me, it had a massive impact in the sense that, unfortunately, very little has changed, but it had more of an impact in the way that his mother was determined to not just go along and say, this is business as usual, we must get a change. And that was what was the most impactful thing for me. And I think you touched on some really interesting points, which hopefully we'll get to come back to, just about the complexity of how we actually move towards change. Um, you know, the the antagonism is is one part, the marching, but when that finishes, what happens? You know, I always like to think you need lots of different voices and kinds of ways of communicating in that conversation to help it to move forward. And uh, this next question is for Paul, because just thinking about what Derek has just mentioned about the fact that you know, racism has kind of changed form a little bit. It's got a new outfit on. It's not quite as um, visible as it was in, in the ways it was. It can be more undercover. Um, how should we be thinking about hate crime as racism, you know, changes shape and form? What should we be looking for and looking at? 
So I think one of the th one of the things that's been um, really important from the, the UK's perspective of moving forward is is, is recognise it as a fundamental human right to be protected from abuse, and seeing it in that context has helped others. So the the, the in two thousand and seven, the Attorney General rejected a hierarchy. So not to say that racism wasn't still the priority, because when we looked at hate crime, it was it was eighty percent of hate crime was racist. But recognising that this is a universal right that we all share to live a life free from abuse. And when we talk about equality, uh, my sense is that that isn't doing the same for different people. It's about recognising that some people require extra support, extra effort, extra protection to achieve the same standard. And, and that recognition that addressing the harm that's caused by, for instance, the issue of the internet and of hate speech and of political hate speech and the rise of nationalist populism across the world is playing out on a global level that has really complicated the state's uh, onus of responsibility on understanding how these things interact and how individuals play out. And we have seen, we did see significant impact on the, on the improvements after the Stephen Lawrence inquiry and the tragic murder of Anthony Walker in 2005 and Jody Dabrowski, a young gay man in the same period of time. When you analyse the criminal justice response, the families of those two victims, equally traumatised and equally tragic circumstances, felt that the criminal justice system was on their side to some degree. Um, and whilst there is that progress, we know that there is examples where that isn't the case. We know there is examples of failures. We know those hostilities exist. And when we see the tragedy of the, the, the Christchurch terrorist attack in New Zealand, and we see that anti-Muslim hate crime increases in the UK in the week following it, means that some people are motivated by that atrocity in a way that most of us would, would only feel more empathy for the victims and those who would identify with that hostility because it isn't an individual threat to that person individually. It's a threat that exists in the society as a whole towards the community as a whole. Sorry, thank you so much. Couldn't quite find the unmute button there, but no, thank you um, so much. And it's interesting kind of what you were, you know, just alluding to how some people are actually motivated to do these things. So, you know, we're, we're talking about something quite deep rooted and systemic. So if this next question could be for Jane, you know, we, we know that there are some deep rooted systemic, systemic, institutional, and obviously personal racism. Because I think sometimes when we talk about the big picture, we can forget that actually any big group is made up of individuals. And so we have to sometimes get it down to the micro so that we can think about what's going on. Um, as part of your practice, how should we be changing the way people are learning before they even get the chance to kind of be on the streets, knowing that most people carry bias and also, are there any ways someone, a question has been asked, are there any ways of screening for levels of racial bias through the process of teaching? Essentially, can some people not make the cut? Interesting, last part. Um, okay, so the students and other people ask me why after a 33 year career in policing, I'm now at the university. Um, one of the reasons for that is because one of my absolute passions is equality and diversity. And I now lecture to students who are planning a future career in law enforcement. They don't all want to be police officers, but lots of them do, but lots of them work, want to work in other areas of policing. So as police staff members or national crime agency, customs and excise, etc. Um, we talk to them and they're part of the lectures and get them to do research on the history of policing. Um, Derek referred in his uh, speech to the Sus laws and what happened in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. It's really important to understand that context to allow the students to have the background. And that wasn't taught when I joined policing in the, in the mid 80s. Um, there was no level of understanding about how policing had treated minority communities. So it's really important that young people are now educated and ultimately everybody who becomes a police officer will have done some research and have a degree because that's the way um, policing is heading, whether you join with a degree or whether you actually um, get a degree while you're in the service. Uh, and we are now educating those young people um, to uh, know the, the history of the past so that they can influence the future. Thank you so much. And I think that's kind of staying on that 
sort of theme in terms of thinking about individuals. Um, so David, you know, when you spoke, my question is, when I hear you speak, and I think everyone will agree with many of the things that you're saying, because they sound very reasonable and like the future way forward. So how do we close that disconnect from what you're saying to every single individual police officer in community, policing in that kind of more equitable way? And there's probably no shortcut to that, but you know, how, how, do, we, how do we begin to get there? Okay, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, so, so I, I think if we take the point Derek was making, the policing's moved forward hugely. And I think that, you know, when, when I uh, made the apology around the history, history of policing, I also talked about feeling trapped in it because, you know, and I, I think this is the, the bit that is really important for us all to, to, to you know, when Derek talked about his journey of a, a strong kind of antipathy to policing, that, but actually, working in the system, taking a chance. And, you know, this is one of the huge issues now about recruiting a more diverse workforce. So I think policing is a lot, a far greater change and transform than people would think. And, you know, I, I say this because, you know, I talked about our cadets, you know, we, we have done cadets in West Midlands. We have done them in challenging inner city schools. We have actually worked with schools to target people with behavioral issues. We have worked really hard to draw to, and actually it's been hugely popular with our police officers to become cadet leaders because we want to reach out and build that link. And actually there are some real barriers, I think, across that. So, you know, I, I think it starts, We Jane talked about education. We've got some explicit ba uh, values in the force. Two of them talk about, I want what one talks about, I want to work in a diverse team. It's actually one of our force values that I want to be in a diverse team. The other one is I will challenge unlawful, uh, you know, unreasonable discriminatory behavior. Um, I wrote to two years ago, I wrote to every officer in the force about actually misogyny and racism and the damage it does. There's a constant narrative. It's black inclusion week next week. One of the exciting things we're doing in the force is encouraging in our most deprived areas that all our black officers and our, our, our biggest black communities that they will come and police that area from across the force of the day to show what a diverse service like. It is constantly on the agenda of a force like West Midlands Police. Um, but equally, you know, the, 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 the guys on the ground have a tough job. And often they will that they they will come into communities. Many of them will not have worked in diverse communities, and their experience of working in those communities can be challenging. And, and and so we've got to, I think, find more time to break the ice. And one of the things austerity's done for a police force like Westminster Police, where one in four police officers has gone in ten years, and we have got a bigger mission. We are busier than ever, and the time for interaction. You know, I was reflecting when I was a commander in Moss Side, I took a whole shift out to do a day where we traded places with young people on stop search. They searched the police. They had to fill out the forms. The police got searched. We created an understanding of each other's perspective. Finding time and space to release people to do that now is really hard. And so we've just got to work on, the, on constantly building, I think, a bridge, an understanding, giving officers a chance, and actually... I think community leadership really needs to encourage more and more young people to want to take a chance on policing. I, I sat through a focus group with young black people who said, you know, I I'd fancy it, but I'd be hounded out in five minutes. Our retention rate for officers is really high. We have very few black and ethnic minority officers who leave us. Um, you know, so we, we've, I think we've got to find a way of uh, dispelling those myths. So, so my kind of formula is clear values, clear standards, clear expectations. It's always in the conversation on the force. It's openly discussed about where we're doing, but actually trying to find some bridges across to the community so they understand policing is not the police force that their parents may have experienced. And so this one's kind of for Derek off the, off the back of that, because your position in terms of being around that table, you know, there are obviously two schools of thought in the community about that. One is, you know, to fund the police, which I think is often... I don't know, people have various understandings of what defunding the police actually means and stands for and whether it is what it sounds like. And then also, the, the so that's the don't get involved, we are not them, you know, it's something going on over there. And obviously your school of thought is about being around the table and, and being a change maker. And I guess as someone myself, I've never been stopped by the police, never had an interaction with the police, but still feel terrified every time a police car is behind me that I could have an interaction and what would happen. You know, how how are we going to really fill that, that gap? Because it's how much sway do community leaders have knowing that community is much more fragmented? 
I remember growing up um, in the 70s and even into the 80s that if you was a person of colour and people knew that you were part of the police, you had to leave the area. You were a Judas, you were a sellout. You could not come around those inner city areas because you had defected to the Babylonians. That is not the case now. And that in itself signifies a massive change, even in people's perception. So I think the first thing to recognize is that we are not in the state that we were in in the 70s and 80s. And it will be totally wrong to continue to behave as if the police are still the dreaded outsiders as they were then. They are not. They have done a massive amount of work and they've moved a huge distance. The problem we have is that in the minds of some sections of society, it actually suits them to maintain this victim status. They don't want things to change because once it changes, they no longer have a purpose. So they would always rake up things 30 years ago as if it's happening today. And then we have to be very mindful about who claim, who speaks or claims to speak for the community because in a lot of cases, they're not actually helping. As a watchdog and, have, uh, and as a person that's worked for many years in trying to reform and at least have some impact in shaping and informing the direction of travel for the better. I myself, I've had death threats. I've been shunned and ostracized. You know, as a black man working with the police service, working with the system, I've had my own challenges. And I accept that some people will hate me because I am not maintaining this victim stance. I'm trying to make a difference. And I accept that that's the lot I have drawn. Even on this call, I'm sure there'll be some people who are furious to see a black man in this position. And I get that, but I'm determined. I, I want my children to grow up in a society where they can walk down the street and know that when they see a police officer, they should not have any fear, but they should have confidence knowing that they have people and guardians in the community who are there to make their lives better. And that is the price I'm prepared to pay, and I am actually paying it because it's better to be inside the tent working with those who are making decisions on policing, as I said before, than outside just throwing stones, just shouting where your stones bounce off the canopy and your voice is rarely ever heard. So as part of the process and as part of the watch, as a watchdog, working with the police, holding them accountable, doing my best to reassure the community that we do need a police service. Can you imagine no police officers? We'd have lawlessness. What we want is an effective, solid, robust police service that reflects the community that it polices, that understands the different challenges and the nuances, and is prepared to adapt and respond to the need. And I'm proud that I'm part of that process. No, thank you so much. Um, and I really want to put this question out to everyone. So uh, please, in an orderly manner, as you so wish, <laughs> answer this question. Um, but th the question is, you know, what is a dream and a vision for policing in the future? And, uh, you know, I would like everyone to answer that from probably their own perspective. And, and what I love about this is we're coming at it from so many different perspectives. So, you know, what's the dream? You know, what would you think if there was one thing that you would say, you know, OK, we, we know it's just a more just world now. What would that thing be? And um, I don't know, maybe I'll go backwards and just start with Jane as you're on my screen at the, at the bottom and go anti-clockwise. OK, I, I'm going to cheat slightly and have two things. The first is that the police service is truly representative of the community it serves. Um, that's probably the easy one. Um, and the second is um, that every person who has a contact with a police officer in the future knows that that police officer is there to help them, to serve them, to solve the problem, to interact with them and has no fear whatsoever uh, that they'll be discriminated against as a result of colour of their skin, gender identity or anything else. Do we just chip in, do we, or does... For me, I just, I, I, I like what Jane has said. Um, I think, for me, I, I simply want the police service to, A, understand, 
and that's an important word. B, be fair. And C, reflect. And as long as we do that, policing is tough. Policing is a difficult job. And anybody thinks it's just about stopping and searching, we see officers losing their lives. Not every day, thankfully, we see some of them seriously injured and they put themselves in, at risk to protect us. Now, most people don't hear about that or see the hard work. We only hear the, 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 the bad things. But for me, I want the police to feel confident to police. I want them to police in a fair way. I want them to reflect the community they police. And I certainly want them to be able to reflect on what they do and be able to respond to changes in an appropriate way. Shall I go next? So, yes. so for me, if I restrict mine to hate crime policy, um, there are two things as well that I would like to see. That, that there, there has been over the last 10 years a huge stride forward in communities' confidence and the ability for victims to come forward. And it's taken us from around about one in six crimes that occur being recorded when you compare recorded crime data and, and, and the British Crime Survey data uh, to one in two, which is really an impressive um, sign of confidence. But I would like that to be universal. So I'd like newly arrived asylum seekers, gypsy traveller communities, transgender victims to have that same level of confidence, disabled victims to have that same level of confidence. And the second point for me is perhaps on an international scale, there is um, the UK massively leads the world in terms of the recognition of hate crime uh, on, a, on a practical level by the police. And the Met Police, just to put that into context, records more hate crime than any country in the world outside England. And the Met Police records more hate crime against its own officers than California records against its citizens. So that r recognition I would like to be universal, but also the impact and the relationship between hate speech, hate crime, and, and atrocities like genocide and terrorism is something that we really need to explore. The global influences, the malign influences that bring around those hostilities and influence those who, who have a propensity to hatred um, really need to be uh, understood and we need, to, we need to better work at how we um, manage and reduce the harm that they cause on a global scale and not just on a local scale. I was going to say, shall I go next? Um, for me, uh, in, in an ideal world, long-term, um, long-term dream would be put me out of a job. You know, there will always be things to learn and understand, but f but there's a lot of reinventing of the wheel. Um, there's a lot of um, things that we've already learnt that we can apply over and over again um, to address any disproportionality, um, any discrimination. Put me out of a job or at least downscale me. You know, I'll, I'll keep a job, downscale me so that I can just keep, maintain what that success of understanding difference. And at the moment, you know, working with uh, within the National Black Police Association, we're starting to, to make strides. We're, we're starting to feel like people who and, and organisations are listening. We have direct contact with the MPCC. We have direct contact with um, the Association of, of Police and Crime Commissioners, uh, the Home Office. Um, it, it's fantastic. Um, we've had some of that before in the past, but um, it felt like we were repeating ourselves over and over again. So really what ideally what we would like is to, to start to make progress, to make waves to make those changes, to get that understanding, um, and to make that to make that difference for for everybody. The community feels safe with uh, that 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 representation and equality, and the people within the organisation who are officers and staff also feel safe to, and proud to say, "I work for the police. This is what I do," um, and and encouraging their their families and their communities to to also do so. Um. So, so I, I feel like I'm Jane, I'm picking a few bits. So of course I'd like a more representative service and I would like us to be the employer of choice for all communities. The, the one I'd focus on is that I would like us to be a service where all communities feel valued by the police, but the police feel valued by society and our communities more. And I, I, you know, when 
I began my career and uh, James started a bit earlier than me, but, but you know, police socialised with police in police clubs and did things as police together. That's not what the police service is like now. It, it, you know, most police officers, more of their friends are not inside policing. But particularly the last year we've been through, and particularly the type of work we've been doing through COVID, you know, that this kind of sense the police is over-criticised and undervalued, I, I, I think is quite palpable at the moment. And I think we need to be very careful, I think, that policing does feel that value. Uh, you know, we, we've clapped for the NHS, and I think the NHS did an amazing job. It's been a pretty tough year for policing. Um, I, I, I don't feel we've had a lot of claps. Uh, and I think we've got to be careful of that, because if the police don't feel valued and they feel over-criticised, policing actually can become very defensive. And, and, and we don't want a police service that feels undervalued. So I guess my question to that would be, and thank you everyone for um, sharing those visions and it's good to hear, is how do we hold that balance of challenge? So we challenge whilst people not feeling that we are not grateful for the work that is done. Because I think there's this is the, the tension that I think people are currently holding. And, and you know, if you spend any time on Twitter, which unfortunately I do, and fortunately, um, very, very polarized. So you're either for or you're against. There's, there's kind of nothing in the middle. So how do we begin to reduce that gap for a bit more understanding um, of how the police service works? Like Derek said, you know, it's not just stop and search, but that's what we tend to hear about. We tend to hear about the things that go wrong. How how do we make this better? How how do we make this better for everyone? Can I can I come straight back in because I kind of closed on that one, but I'll be dead dead quick. So you know, last year because of what happened, George Floyd was a, was rightly another cathartic year for policing. Just we were at Stephen Lawrence Day. Stephen Lawrence massive cathartic moment for policing. So last year was a cathartic moment, the revisiting, the fact that there are black officers and staff in the force who have had their microaggressions where people have touched their hair because they took black hair, all those horrible things that we found out that, you know, sadly, that, that these things still happen. This year for me is about talking up and, and solving. You know, we're going to talk about what we're going to do about use of force. It's, it's not going to be the right answer, but we're going to talk about the great stuff we do because, you know, we can have a deficit-based approach and keep talking about what's wrong. Or we can have an assets-based approach to talking about what's great and how we're going to make it better. And I think this is the year to be asset-based. Thank you. And a, a quick question for, I mean, there's so much to cover tonight. We are not <laughs> going to cover this massive, it feels like a massive ocean. Um, but one thing that I wanted to, to, to kind of ask you um, about, Dion, is in terms of the recruitment process, how do a lot of black officers feel? You know, we, we know that bias works its way into these kinds of processes, you know, by default, by design, depends on what you think. Um, but what do you have to say about, about that? Um, to be honest, I think there is a, has been a lot of work um, gone into uh, the recruitment process, particularly with the, um, with the, the, the PQF, the PC uh, recruitment routes. Uh, we are again direct contact with uh, the uh, the uplift program and the leads on the uplift program, and that consultation has taken place. Um, we get the opportunity as a staff, local staff networks and national staff associations, uh, and not just ourselves or in in the MBPA, the other the other um, uh, staff associations to to observe the process, whether that is. Uh, an internal recruitment process, whether that is a promotional process, whether it is the new PC recruitment processes, to observe and understand um, how any sort of bias can can be formed in within those processes, and it's it's really important. So I've seen it with my with my own eyes, without without malice or intention, but it it does manage to leak into the process. So I think it's that that ongoing consultation with um, those involved in recruitment, whether that's the College of Policing, or whether it's the, the, the higher education institutions that, that, um, that, that, that support the academic side of the PC recruitment, it's that constant consultation and understanding of, right, why, why is this happening? Why is the disproportionality here? How can we, how can we address that? Why are people of certain ethnicities falling out of the recruitment process at this stage? And it, it's a, again, it's a learning curve. Um, some of the remedies are not not brand new. We can go back and, and have a look uh, and utilise those. 
Uh, but, you know, I, I think there has to be that scrutiny, the scrutiny of, of the processes and that consultation without a shadow of a doubt. Without it, it you know, we'll, we'll just remain the same. Thank you so much. Now, we got a question earlier on, and I'm going to put this to Paul. And the question was around reporting um, racial hate crimes. And the person said, what do you do? And, and they were specifically speaking about Ag University, they didn't name it. Um, what do you do if someone does not take the reporting of your racism seriously? Where do you go? So so one of the challenges we've talked about today, we've, we've been fortunate to be in an, another event where um, uh, ne Dr. Neville Lawrence spoke, and one of the things he spoke about in in terms of the the remaining issues, uh, two issues really stood out for me. One was about um, a refusal to accept uh, that institutional racism is gone. The second was about the infrastructure around, particularly black communities, and the the inability to to communicate with with communities. And one of the one of the problems with the demise of the CRE and the race equality councils that that sort of uh, were in virtually every town and city up and down the country is that there isn't that vocal point of, of, of a central response that supports groups. And there's a myriad of small groups that represent individual, uh, individual communities diversely spread. People are starting to identify more by religious identity than, than race identity to some degree um, in some quarters. So we, we have l less infrastructure in terms of support networks within towns and cities up and down the country. So in, in a practical term, if people don't f find satisfaction within the police, there is obviously the complaints procedures locally and nationally. There's also uh, support structures through True Vision, which is our national um, online presence, which gives people the ability to report matters online, um, gives the ability to communicate with national leaders who can speak with um, force policy leads. So there is those infrastructures, the, social, the civil society um, capacity has been massively impacted uh, by austerity measures because most of the funding came from state authorities who've had a choice of removing colleagues or removing grants and, and that's made it really difficult. So things aren't as easy as they should be, uh, but there's always somebody there to help and True Vision is a good central point with lots and lots of organisations who can support victims and offer advocacy if they need uh, an intermediary. Thank you so much. And I think on that note, um, we are probably going to begin kind of wrapping up. But I think I would just kind of um, love to hear a, a final thing, because, you know, we're here for Staffordshire University and in terms of students and thinking about their futures and, you know, other young people thinking about what's next and thinking about how we begin to heal the divide between the police and the community because it is, it's there and it's real. Um, I would just love to hear from everyone just kind of one thing that you think could help us to, to make more steps, especially in this uh, current climate we find ourselves in. I'll start with Derek. <laughs> uh, one thing I, I think we, we, we can all do is be determined to work together. Can I go to today? Yeah, so <clears throat> we need to recognise we didn't get here, um, you know, in a, a kind of 12 months or 30 years, you know, there are hundreds of years of history that have come to this point. So what I would say is, you know, let, let you know, our commitment, we, sh we should not expect that we will fix this quickly, but we can all make it better. And I think let's take a build on view back to my asset point. You know, there are lots of really great things. Let's try and make the great things even greater instead of pointing at the things that aren't right, because we all want a better society. We all want great vision to drive us on. But actually, our, our, the, the time we hold the baton, we, we'll make it better. So let's concentrate on what we can make better. Jane, next, please. So I'm going back to something that Derek said, which was, um, be inside the tent making a difference rather than the outside throwing stones and my mind's a plea to the students really um, as you graduate and go into your careers go into different careers but careers where you can make a difference you can hold people to account and um, 
I'm going to make a plea for policing. Um, policing does need to represent the community and therefore it needs more people from black and minority ethnic communities into policing. It's a fantastic career and you can make much more of a difference by being part of it. Paul, next please. So, so I, I was ready to talk about the journey and, and not beat ourselves up because we're on a journey and recognising there's still a long way to go. But uh, since that's already been covered, I'm going to I'm going to look at the internationalisation and and, and recognise that we're trying to deal with local organisations and national legislation frameworks dealing with international pressures and international tensions. And I think we need to get better at understanding that the the, the internet has brought our our population to be global citizens and, and not necessarily local and we need to um, respond better in understanding that. And Dion, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, for me, um, be curious and courageous. Be curious if you're unsure, ask the questions, make sure you are getting it right. Um, and be courageous, challenge, challenge the status quo. Again, challenge if you think something's not right or you're unsure about something, let that kick in and do and, and try and do the right thing. So for me, yeah, curious and courageous. Well, I think um, tonight I found it absolutely fascinating and, you know, as a communications professional, I do believe that talking about these things and communicating is really the only way that we are actually going to get to solutions. I'm actually writing a book on it, actually. But um, that's the only way we're going to get to solutions is if we all play our part. And I think we've heard really clearly from all sides tonight that it is only by cooperation, collective endeavour, that's the only way that we are going to begin to close the gap, be it painful and long history. But, you know, I think you've heard from everyone a vision of where things could be. And so that's really what we're all fighting for. So thank you very much to all of our amazing panellists, our keynote speakers, and also thank you very much to Staffordshire University for allowing the space for this debate to happen. So I hope that everyone has a good evening and let's keep talking.